we're going to jump right in, okay? Lord, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you, Lord, that we can laugh about just life. I thank you, Lord, that um, all of these things just make us human. They make us grow and relate to one another. And life is not easy. It is hard. But Lord, I am so thankful that amongst all of the chaos of life, there are those amazing moments as yesterday when we realize as we lean into that heavenly realm that the power that is there the beauty that is there. And from that comes just amazing, deep worship. When we celebrate all the works that you have done through your son, Jesus. And so God, I pray that we wouldn't just be hearers today, um, that we wouldn't just want that Holy Spirit feeling or something for us, but we realize that it's something given to us to flow out of us to the world. And so stuff happens. We get pushed on all sides. But God, I pray that we would respond with great compassion um, and that we would hold our tongue. We would be slow to anger. We would be abounding in love like you, that we would have a joy that is contagious. Um, Thank you for laughter, by the way, Lord, because laughter is hope, a hope of a joy that is coming, that we won't always be in that dark place, but the story continues. And so we just love you, God. Speak to us this morning. Um, Speak to me through my own uh, words. You are worthy of our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I asked you to spend some time in the Psalms. Um, Don't know if you did, but I hope you remember me saying that the Psalms teach us to pray. Remember? The Psalms teach us to pray. They give language to our emotion, which is necessary because we have emotion. And the majority of the Bible would tell you to function out of a deep knowledge and truth and not so much emotion. And so it's beautiful when you see that a third of the Psalms are laments and it's suffering and pain and it's putting words to that emotion because we have to get it out. And we talked about last week how it's super interesting that if you look at a Psalm 22, uh, the Psalm that Jesus quoted, it's a Psalm of David in a deep time of suffering that half of it is the pain and very little of it is petition and the rest of it is amazing praise and so it shows us as an example that there is a necessity of expressing our suffering and our emotion and our pain and to get it out most of the time we think oh well he already knows so I don't need to really go into it well it's not really for him it's for who it's for you And it connects you together in relationship. If my daughter comes to me with pain, I will sit and I will listen and I will listen. I'll even take it in the chin if necessary for her to get all of that out um, because that's what a relationship is. It is communicating with one another and talking with one another and a lot of listening. And so the father is telling us, Jesus is telling us, give it to me. I'll listen, pour it out, get that emotion out. And then in that Psalm, basically he says, help me. Simple as that. Most of the time I don't share my emotion and I spend the majority of my prayer suggesting to Jesus how he should possibly help me because I've got it all solved, right? And so then after the help me, he tells himself the truth that all of these emotions, okay, That's emotion, and the truth is that God did not turn away. He has not abandoned. He will not. And coming out of that is an amazing praise. So it's not surprising that in the 10 days between the ascension and the coming of Pentecost, that they spent a whole lot of time in the psalm. 
And so when Peter is reading the Psalms, he quotes Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 about the things regarding Judas. He's feeling all that pain. And I told you it was as if he were reading Jesus's journal of what he was emotionally going through and some of the rage and the betrayal. But in that, he comes forth with... Um, basically a job to do. And the fact is, we talked about how Jesus is true Israel, that he is the one that came out of Egypt, that passed through the waters, that was tested in the wilderness. Um, he has given his life. He has risen from the dead and ascended to his throne, ushering in new creation, this new kingdom. And so he has done that. And, um, so symbolically speaking, if they are setting out in this new kingdom, they're one patriarch short of the 12. And so he comes out, Peter comes forth and says, we need to pick another. And so that's what they do. Um, in verse 21, it says, so this is what has to be done. There are plenty of people who have gone about with us all the time that our master Jesus was coming and going among us, starting with John's baptism until the day he was taken from us. Let one of them be chosen to be alongside us as a special witness of his resurrection. They chose two. Joseph was called Barsabbas with the surname Justice and Matthias. Lord, they prayed, you know the hearts of all people. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to receive this particular place of service and apostleship from which Judas went away to go to his own place. So they cast lots for them. The lot fell on Matthias and he was enrolled along with the 11 disciples. So the credentials, I mean, there was, there was a large group that they could have picked from. I mean, at this point we know that there's still 120 that are together now, often, that 120. And so what they did is they basically vetted, looking at, and, and two of the main cr credentials was that they would have to have follow Jesus from when? From the baptism, and they would have had to have been a witness to the risen Lord. Okay, because remember, that is what they are out to do. They are to be witnesses about what they have seen. That's the apostleship, that they have seen the risen Lord. And so they narrow it down to two men, and then they leave it up to the Lord. Because who sees the heart? God sees the heart. We learned that when we did the life of David, it, it, that man looks at the outer appearance. We can only go so far. But, and we can judge the heart according to behaviors, but only God can truly see the heart. And so they cast lots. Do you remember what that is? It's, uh, we, we talked about this a lot when we taught Old Testament books. It's like this holy dice. Okay. And it was to where God could speak. The priest kept it in their garment, and they would cast a lot, and basically you would get a yes or no answer. So there has to be like a choice between the two, or a yes or a no. They would often pinpoint, if you remember, certain things. Like if they were trying to find one person in the Old Testament, do you remember how they would do it? They'd bring forth the tribes, and they'd cast lots, and then they determine which tribe and then they bring forth the families and they would cast lots and by the lot they would determine which family and then they would pick a father and, and then they would find that person. And so that is how they did it. And so the lot fell on Matthias. These guys would be the continuation of the kingdom work of Jesus, which began at his baptism because he was anointed into ministry there. Okay, the Holy Spirit took on the form of a dove and came down and anointed him in his public ministry. And he was approved of by the Father. In him, I am satisfied. He was then tested in the wilderness and came out pure, trusting fully his Father. And then he goes into his three-year ministry. So it had to be from that moment on, and they had to bear witness of the resurrection. 
N.T. Wright says the church is either the movement which announces God's new creation or it's just another irrelevant religious sect. Everything relies on the resurrection, bodily resurrection of our Lord. That is what we believe. And so that is what their witness was all about. But then I thought about it. I wonder what speaks louder, our words or our life? What do you think speaks louder about that in regards to the fact that we too now are a new creation? We're going to look at that in Christ Jesus. Is it our words or is it a changed life? And I'm not just talking about, okay, behaviors, all right? Um, I'm going to throw my new husband under the bus and here we go. And um, I'm going to tell you, I don't, you'll never hear me talk badly um, about who I love, okay? Now, I'm, I'm honest about the fact that we're just human beings, all right? That makes us bond together, right? Because if you think you got me up on a pedestal, you don't know me. All right. And so, and that's why I love this Bible study is that we're all like real people, but he had a complete life change and it's been fun to watch. And I'm going to tell you, yes, behaviors are different. The thing we were talking about last night, actually, uh, with the Gardais at church is the fact of how different Rob's mouth is. He's a sailor, people. Okay. He's in the military for 28 years. Have you ever met a military man or a cop or a fire? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? A little salty. Their mouths. And here's the thing. Most people would think that, oh my gosh, I would be so, <gasps> at his language. I knew exactly where he was. And I know that God is the one, uh, me going, uh, oh, e, ah, like that drives me nuts. You know, when you go to the movie with someone and you know it's a secular movie and you're watching the movie and a cuss word comes because you know it's going to because you can't watch a movie without them because they're not any. And you sit by someone who acts like they've never heard the words before and they just sit there and go, oh, oh. I'm like, go sit over there. I can't, I cannot even watch this movie because you're so appalled, but yet... You know, you got issues too, right? So what I'm saying is, it's not just beha- behaviors begin to change. And we were laughing the other day about how much better his mouth is. And the fact is that, you know, before I would have to say things like, um, you need to know your audience when we walk in this place. You know, you, so just watch your mouth, okay? And we would laugh, and I don't say that very often. And Along the way, as the Spirit has filled and begun to move, and you are a new creation, and your life changes, and your acquaintances change, and you're getting poured into, guess what begins to happen? We don't hear so many of of those words. Now, if you drop a cabinet on your finger, oh yeah, it's coming, right? But But the key is this. Here's what I, so I've noticed that. But it's not just behavior. What I've truly noticed is a different joy. A different uh, spirit that comes out. A love and a joy that comes forth as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yes, behaviors, they begin to change, but it is that new nature that is, it's like a new breath that has come in and you're getting to see it lived out. And that right there is going to be one of the greatest witnesses that he has if he's around people that knew the old self and now there is something alive and different inside of this joy and this smile and this brightness in the eyes and a laugh, those kinds of things. And so, yes, and you, you speak about what you've seen and you speak, but your life has to what? Exhibit that. Have you ever been around some of the most pious, grumpy Christians you've ever met in your life? How in the world 
One of the biggest displays of the activity of the Spirit that you're going to see is a joy. Listen, I have pain. I have deep pain and suffering. And there are times I drown, but there has to be, there is a joy in me because I know the Spirit. And although, like Peter, I grieve the death of something, the death of someone for me, but that, that past, the end, the, that finished thing that you can't change, and although it can be painful, that the story continues, there's joy in the fact that the story continues. It's not over. I have a glorious hope and a future. And so I stay engaged in that. And this is what they're witnesses to. But they're human beings. The old life is gone. New life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about that. The Amplified Bible in 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. I love this. And we all, with unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And we all, with unveiled faces, where what what story do you think of in the Old Testament when you hear about unveiled or a veiled face? Uh, do you remember when Moses went up to receive the law and he came down and his face was what? It was glowing from being in the presence of the Lord. And he veiled his face. Some may think because that would frighten. No, he veiled it because over time it would fade. And yet it says here, and we all with unveiled face, seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Who are you looking at in the mirror? You, the glory of the Lord that you are seeing progressively in you being transformed from glory to another stage of glory. It's more and more and more that we are being transformed into the image of Christ with unveiled face because it's not diminishing, it's what? It is increasing, and this is the work of the Spirit. It is not, I am not Rob's Holy Spirit. I can help him. I can be contagious. I can bring things across in a, in a, a really good spirit. I can exemplify. I can love to where you see something completely different. And he does the same for me. But it is that work of the Spirit. In their decision, they could only go so far. God had to make the final choice, and he chose Matthias. When the day of Pentecost arrived, we're in chapter 2, praise the Lord, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So somehow it started in the house and it ended up on the southern steps. I, I don't know how, but man, there was a ruckus and that ruckus poured out in the streets. It was so awesome. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. I don't know about you, but growing up, when I would hear the word Pentecost, I would immediately think Pentecostal, okay? Because I grew up Southern Baptist. And if we raised our hand, they thought you had a question. Or, I mean, we had to wait to see if the preacher was going to clap, and if he clapped, we could clap. If not, all you would hear is the deacons go, amen, amen. And so when I would hear Pentecost, what I would think of, right, is this crazy, like, jibber-jabber speaking in tongues. I'm just being honest with you. Jumping up and down. Some, oh, my goodness. I went one time to a church here in Phoenix when I was younger, and Hillsong was there singing. And uh, what's that girl? Shout to the Lord. Uh, it was when that first came out. Oh, I love that song. And the whole place started jumping up and down. And I thought, I was in the balcony. I'm going to die. 
this balcony's going down. I'm, we're going to die. I'm going to die right here worshiping the Lord. It's all good. But it was like this, this thing, right? So when I would think of Pentecost or Pen, I think Pentecostal, I would think of this kind of stuff or this holy laughter situation. I had all kinds of funny clips I could show you, but I thought, eh, I'm not going to go there. But basically it was a lot of noise and a lot of waving of hands. That, that's what I would think when I would think Pentecost. I don't want you to think that. I want you to think in the terms of scripture, Pentecost. Pentecost was their festival or uh, their sacred day. It was one of the pilgrimage uh, festivals where you have to travel to Jerusalem to experience it, but it was 50 days after Passover. All right. And so it was an agricultural festival. It, it's where you would bring in your first uh, sheaf of wheat and you would give it to God as uh, to be thanks, thankful because of the harvest. It was like first fruits. Do you understand what I mean? Like, like the tithe, giving your first fruits to the Lord um, as with an attitude of thanksgiving. But it wasn't just that. You're also praying that the rest of the crop will be harvested like this first sheaf. And so it is, it's agricultural, but it's more than that because I hope that when you hear things like Pentecost, your mind now just always go back to the desert, okay? Everything about the New Testament points back <laughs> to either Genesis or Exodus. Are you getting used to that a little bit? The more you study the New Testament. So when you hear Pentecost, you need to think because Passover was when they were freed from Egypt, right? And Passover was the day they sacrificed the lambs so that the angel would pass over them. And then they were freed from Egypt. But Pentecost was 50 days later when Moses ascended up the mountain to receive the law. All right. Was on Pentecost. So it isn't just about first fruits, but God giving a redeemed nation the way of life that would be a means of blessing to the nations. So it's not hard to see this symbolism fulfilled here in the disciples, because in many ways they are the first fruits. They are this first harvest of the spirit and, and through them, the rest of the harvest, what? will grow and be brought in. But it's also related to, as far as Moses goes up in the wilderness, Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law from God, written by the finger of God, and then he brought it down to the people. So put this in our story. In our story, Jesus, and who was Jesus? Do you remember what Moses said? One's coming that will be like me. All points. It's all tied in. He then, what does he do? He has ascended up into the heavens through the ascension, and now he's coming down again, but how? The Holy Spirit. And he is coming down, not with the law written on carved stone, but it is the Spirit of God that's going to be written on man's heart. Okay, so I want you, I just said a lot of things. I'm going to slow down for just a minute. Think about that. Because when Luke writes this, he is writing it to Old Testament Jewish people. He is writing when he's, they're fluent in Old Testament. We are not. So when they hear the word Pentecost, they are thinking harvest, first fruits, attitude of thanksgiving, with the anticipation of the entire crop, what? Being harvested. They're also thinking of Moses going up to the mountain to be with God and bringing back the law, which the law is life. Because if you live this life, how you are created in my image, this is how you were being made to live as a person and a community, if you live this way, you will what? Be a blessing to all nations. You see all of that being fulfilled in this situation from the harvest to the fact that Jesus, this 
now Moses, greater Moses, has gone up to be with the Lord and he, I mean, to be with the Father and he has sent, he has returned through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not come with laws written on stone, but comes and he is going to write it on the hearts of men. This is a big deal. I am always quoting to you Ezekiel 37, but this time I want you to hear it. So go to Ezekiel 37. You're going to get familiar with their language and their stories, their prophecies. And so when you read it now, you're going to hear it in a different way. Picture this, now fulfilled in the light of Jesus' death and resurrection and his ascension to be seated on the throne, the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. He is king and God sending that promised spirit that is going to come breathe into the life of humanity, making us something brand new, a new creation, that of which Jesus was the first fruits. And he is going to breathe in us. And instead of legalism, where we have written by the finger of God on the tablets, the law, the spirit of God is going to breathe into mankind and write his principles in our heart. But listen to it from their prophet. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinew upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, and as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, those bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it declares the Lord. Do you understand this is what we're witnessing? The coming together, the preaching, the coming together into a new body, into a new people, but without the breath, what? They're dead. Regeneration comes from the breath the Holy Spirit, wind, breath, Holy Spirit, breathing in, making us alive in Christ Jesus as a new creature in Christ Jesus, made new, following the first fruits of Jesus, who was the first true humanity. And that is the picture here. And that is what he's telling Nicodemus. Look at John 3. John 3, 7 and 8. He's talking to Nicodemus about being born from above. Look at the references he gives this man who is the greatest teacher in Israel who would have known this Old Testament scriptures by memory. 
He says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again like Nicodemus. Why is this shocking you? Nicodemus could have quoted probably by memory the entire chapter of Ezekiel 37. He says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound. You see these familiar phrases and you hear it sound, the roar of the wind, the power of the spirit, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. It is a new life and it is spirit generated. In both cases, the wind is a symbol of regeneration the roar of the wind. It should also make you think of the spirit of God, Genesis chapter two. Why should it make you think of that? The spirit of God hovering over what? Over the deep. It is the triune God. He always operates that way. It is the will of the father through the son by the power of the what? of the spirit, the breath, the wind, the engine. And what is interesting to me is, yes, it is a roar, but in Genesis, what the Holy Spirit does is he takes chaos and he makes it what? Order. So sometimes when I go in these scenes where, and it's about something new, it's about a uh, new birth and it, all it is is chaos, I just wonder, is that truly the Holy Spirit or what? Some other spirit, something that we're generating. And so you hear the roaring of the wind. I want you to think as we read through these about your senses experiencing because they're going to hear the wind. They're going to see the tongues of fire and they're going to speak the praises of the Lord, right? It, they're involved in every way. Also, the spirit is life. Without it, there is what? Death. Those dry bones, they're together. They got meat, right? But the fact is they're still what? They're still dead. The spirit is all about life and death. Being alive in the spirit or being dead. Luke chapter three talks of this. Let's look at that for a second. Luke three, 16 and 17. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Do you see how the spirit and fire together in our scene, what do we see? the wind, the spirit, the tongues of fire, all of that is together. It says his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Fire is also representing the presence of God. We see it in the burning bush. We see it in the fire by night. Okay, and so this is a life or death situation. Because of the spirit, we have been made alive in Christ Jesus. We are one in Christ. That is one reason I believe in once saved, always saved. You have been made alive, born again. You are a new creation. You are in Christ Jesus. I cannot see that being reversed. Um. We've been made alive in Christ, one with Christ, reconciled with God, and we now have access to a heavenly realm. This is life and death, spirit and fire, okay? And so here you have this idea that the, he has his winnowing fork. What does that mean? You pick up the wheat, you throw it in the air, and the wind does what? That, it blows away the chaff. There's no life there. And then it is burned with fire. Our God is a consuming fire. So what means life to some? This life that means what? Death to others. It's this double-sided, right? You have uh, God being this consuming fire that burns up the chaff. This death, it, it, can't, it can't survive this consuming fire. But yet over here, you see the picture of the burning bush. 
that is on fire but not being consumed. And so it has everything to do with these pictures like Ezekiel 37 to be made alive in Christ Jesus. That is what the Holy Spirit does. And we're going to talk about, and that happens when we put our faith in Jesus. And that, in my opinion, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is when we put our faith in Jesus and we are made alive in Christ Jesus, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that is a one-time deal. And then I believe that water, that is regeneration. And water baptism is the first act of obedience publicly showing what has happened. It's my, that's my opinion, okay? And so that is what it means to be made alive in Christ Jesus. They see divided tongues. Can you imagine that? These tongues of fire that come down. And then they're divided and they land on each individual person. Separation of the tongues of fire. They came to rest on each of them. Though under the old covenant, the divine presence of Yahweh rested on the nation. I want you to get this. Of Israel. And in the Old Testament, this is such a good question one of my high schoolers asked. But wait a minute. How did the Holy Spirit operate in the Old Testament? I'm like, great question. Right? Right? The Spirit of God, right, selected Israel. He was upon Israel, corporate. But yet, he, the Spirit would come upon individuals in the Old Testament if, for a certain task or calling. You see that with David. You see that even, um, you'll even see it with Samson, where it says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, right? But at this point, it is very different. This time, it's personal. The Spirit now rests with people individually, inviting us personally into a relationship with God through the Spirit. So this doesn't do away with the corporate. It is the Spirit of God that unifies us together. So instead of being on the nation and then coming upon individuals, the Spirit of God comes and dwells inside of who? inside of us, and it's out of that personal regeneration and that personal relationship with God. We don't neglect the corporate. That individual change brings us what? Together as a corporate body of Christ, but it's motivated by a personal relationship with God. Here's an amazing quote. The whole point is that through the Spirit, some of the creative power of God himself comes from heaven to earth and does its work here. The aim is not to give people a spirituality which will make things on earth irrelevant. The point is to transform earth with the power of heaven, starting with those parts of earth which are bodies, minds, hearts, and lives of the followers of Jesus as a community. If you were at CCV this week, you heard the message about compassion. That's what this is all about. That we have, we've been made alive in Christ. The spirit of God dwells inside of us, not to be kept, but to be what? Poured out to others. That word compassion, he kept saying, it's the word of, you know, womb. It's, it's basically gut. It means I am moved in my innards, I am moved in my gut to put emotion into what? Motion. That I am motivated out of that own personal relationship with Jesus, that it is to be given away. And so we work together as a community. We believe in Jesus because of objective evidence and faith that the Spirit is wooing us, but our personal experience with God is subjective. We should have personal experience and relationship with Jesus. That's mine, it's my personal experience. But yet, it's not for me just to be kept, it is to do what? To give it away. The risen Jesus in heaven is the presence in God's sphere of the first part of earth to be transformed into new creation in which heaven and earth are joined. The pouring out of the spirit on earth is the presence in our sphere of the sheer energy of heaven itself. 
The gift of the Holy Spirit is a direct result of the ascension of Jesus. He sends us heaven power for redeeming work, not just for ourselves, but for our community. How we doing? Do we just want an experience for ourselves? Is, are we so narcissistic in our relationship with Jesus? It's all about us. It has never been that. It is always leaning into the heavenly power, allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to come through us, which will transform us more and more and more into the image of God. But the purpose is to flow then out of us and to transform our communities. How are we doing? Because if there's going to be a change in this world, it's going to have to be through us. And it, it's not going to be, to be quite honest, through our vote, through drawing the sword. It is going to be living out the fruit of the Spirit, a changed, regenerated life. It is going to be showing that kind of compassion that we heard about this week. Verse 5 goes on to say, Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia? I can't even say half this. Egypt and the part of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, those who have basically converted to Judaism, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mockingly said, they are filled with new wine. <laughs> How can you read this and not think about Babel? The Tower of Babel, right? The fact that God had commissioned us starting in the Garden of Eden, where the heavenly realm and the earthly realm overlapped, to be his image on the earth and to bring that heavenly realm throughout the earth. And we failed because we decided we would be the authority instead of God. And it wasn't long before we did rule. We just ruled, you know, in our image, building our empire. And we then tried to build a way to the heavenly that's a joke. And we built this empire under violence and oppression. One people, one language, in complete rebellion against God. And instead, God came down and did what? Confused their languages. And by confusing their languages, that stopped and the nations were dispersed. And they were divided up. And in many ways, that was slowing down the wickedness of men because now different people groups could police others. And it had this slowing down process. But here, God has always loved all nations. He just picked one. And through that in his sovereignty and through that nation, and they weren't that great. Read their stories. Okay? We're in good company. He watched over that nation because of his sovereign will, because he made a promise that through them a redeemer would come, the true king. And so we watch now that in this time of Pentecost, he does the opposite. And instead of slowing down, he's lighting something on fire. Instead of using language to divide, he is using language to what? Draw together. But what is beautiful about it it's not the complete reverse. It's almost like Babel redeemed. Because although um, he's using language, right, to light the church on fire and the gospel on fire and to unite people in Christ Jesus in one spirit, they don't all speak one language. It's not like we went back to one language. They still spoke what? Their language. 
They just heard the gospel in their language. I'm going to be honest with you. I think this story is more about the hearing than the speaking of the tongues. The fact that they heard the gospel in their language. And then what were they able to do? Then they go back to where they're from, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit as a temple of God. And they're no longer forced to come together on certain times corporately. They realize that what? They can worship the Lord in the spirit in their home countries, right? And so you have this true unity without the subjugation of a, a people group. Do you understand? Anytime man tries to do this, they always have to put one people group down or oppress them or transform them into theirs. This is a beautiful deal with Christianity throughout all of the world where we have this unity in the spirit of God, but we keep the diversity of the beautiful nations. Only God could do that. And so you have this beauty of the different cultures, but we are one in Christ Jesus. And they heard the gospel message and he lit it on fire. How? It was not through mankind. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit. When that, when Jesus ascended and he sent the Holy Spirit down, we are leaning into that. And it is through that power that we are made new, but that we are a part of the redemption of this world. That is what we're a part of. It's not about us. And so why are we not leaning into the spirit? Yesterday, I was out in my backyard and I'm telling you what, I was worshiping the Lord and the jets from Luke Air Force Base were coming by. And I was like, gosh, this is ironic, you know, about defending our country in the United States and the battles all between the nations. And yet here I am praising the Lord. And there are other Christians all over the world lifting up their praises to God because we're united in the spirit of God because this is not our home yet. And God will redeem it, but we are in the heavenly. And that is awesome. So I thought that's how we're going to end today. So I'm going to have him play the song that I was worshiping to because I'm going to tell you what, if you ever, after all this of Acts, listen to, listen to the words of this song. And now it is the scripture, like just being shouted out to you. You got that back there? Jesus looked at his disciples in that upper room and he said, oh, y'all think something's coming to an end. And I'm telling you, you ain't seen nothing yet because the spirit lit the flame and the church was ignited. It was the power of the heavenly realm poured down through us, which has to transform us. It has to, it does its work inside of us when we lean in and it pours forth out of us into a community and the community is transformed. If that is not happening, then we need to stop what we are doing and we need to lean in to the heavenly. We have become way too comfortable in the earthly. This is not our home. We have a purpose and we have a job to do. And it looks like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Amen. Have a good day.